Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the November edition of our This Month non-virtual lecture series. We have a great treat for you this month. We have a speaker in-house. Uh, we have Dr. Phil Choi, who is um, associate professor and chair of the physics, astronomy, I assume department yes. of Pomona College. Uh, Dr. Choi received his PhD from uh, UC Santa Cruz and will be speaking this evening about, uh, well I assume he'll be talking about an adaptive optics bench which he was principal investigator on, which was designed and mounted on the the Table Mountain one meter, I almost said solar telescope, <laughs> uh, one meter telescope. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Dr. Phil Choi. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, so I was really excited to come up here. I've never been up to Big Bear Observatory, and it's been one of the places I've been wanting to come with students for at least the last five or six years once I realized how active the science was up here. And so this is really a, a great opportunity for me. So thank you for the invitation. Um, I, the other reason I wanted to be up here was because I understood it was a small group, but I really wanted to have the opportunity to be face-to-face -face and have it be more of a seminar style. I've prepared my talk less as kind of a pure long lecture or, or, or a plenary, as opposed to modularized. And so as I'm walking through this, I might just stop and jump around. So if people have questions about things or interest, I'm happy to let you all drive what we talk about, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So I will say, since this work is largely an instrumentation project, I won't have tons of astrophysics, so I want to start with this just to kind of wet that out a little bit. Um, I'll say my background is that I actually have done my astrophysics research in stellar astrophysics, galaxy evolution, and dabbled a little bit in kind of galaxy evolution as it pertains to cosmology. I'd done very little instrumentation work. Um, so my background was at Caltech and at Santa Cruz. And so when I came to Pomona, I was really motivated to do something a little bit different and do something that I could really um, engage in with my students. So this project, even though it's an instrumentation project, I should warn, I am not, or I don't feel like an instrumentation person quite yet. I'm still uh, very much in development. Um, Part of the motivation I'll talk about was trying to find projects that I could kind of ramp up with students. I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So not just the project, but kind of how it dovetails with, with the mission at Pomona College. So I have this up here just to motivate a little bit, because in addition to the AO instrument, which is really a high resolution imaging instrument, um, mm -hmm. this project has been ongoing for a few years now, but I've recently kind of transitioned to a new project, which is looking at not just high resolution in a spatial domain, but high resolution in time observations. And so that's kind of disconnected, except for the fact that they're high resolution, but in very different dimensions. So if I have time, I'll, I'll, I want to talk a little bit about that, that third dimension there, which is time in this case. Um, but the main reason I have this up is to motivate what high resolution or ultra high resolution does for us. And so I'll walk through these panels for a second. Um, and I understand we had a little, there was a little intro AO talk last week, and so um, please, if, if this is, uh, if I need to speed up a little bit, I'd be happy to do it at any time. But on the left here, if you may or may not have seen this, this is an image of real, real data um, of the galactic center with and without an adaptive optic system. So you can go out there with a tech telescope and you'll see something like this. This is the core of the galactic center. Once you turn on an AO system, like the one at Keck, for instance, on a 10 meter, you can increase your resolution by a factor of 10 easily, okay? Um, much more than that, actually, at Keck. So this is real data. If you take time series images of this galactic center, you can actually map out the motions of stars. And so the motions of stars here, and this is data, even though it looks like it might be a simulation, this is actually a visualization of real data taken over the time scale of about a decade. And so what they've been able to do here is map out, well, from 1996 roughly to 2006, um, the motions of stars as they're orbiting around a galactic, uh, galactic center of black hole. So this data is nothing that you could have gotten with this kind of resolution, clearly. And so what this, allow this is only enabled by high resolution techniques, namely adaptive optics. Um, and what this allows us to do is kind of merge observations with simulation up here. So the simulators are really fortunate. So you can kind of crank up the resolution on anything you want. 
And so the simulators can make these beautiful images of the galactic center, of interactions of black holes and stellar orbits. But for years, simulators would be looking at this, and observers would be looking at not this, but the previous image. And mm -hmm. so there's this huge disconnect, and really we would barely even talk to each other because we were just kind of speaking different languages. So what this technological advance allowed us to do was really start communicating and opening up new science avenues that were really just kind of sitting in, you know, theorists' computers for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really just to motivate that a lot of the advances that we often see um, don't come from kind of a moment of brilliance. It often comes from kind of technological advance and recognizing how you can use that technological advance to your kind of scientific advantage. And so that's one of the things I really want to emphasize. Mm -hmm. And so as an observer, I was in a mode where I was kind of um, um, learning to use other people's instruments. The motivation for me coming and building this was I wanted to train my students in the tool of actually doing their own developments to figure out how they could transform the science they were thinking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the motivation. The, the first part of my talk, and maybe probably the bulk of my talk, will be about Kapow. This is a MEMS-based natural guide star adaptive optics system. So this differs a little bit from the laser guide star system, only in that we don't shoot a laser, okay? Everything else internal is pretty much the same, but we use natural guide stars in the sky as references as opposed to an artificial laser. There are pros and cons to that, which I'm happy to go into, but I'm just gonna, um, I'm gonna um, push that off for a moment. I'll talk a little about the instrument and our telescope, but first I wanna kind of talk about the team. Because if anyone's familiar with Pomona College, you will know that it's not a graduate institute. We don't have graduate students or postdocs. We have lots of remarkable undergraduates though. And so in our case, we didn't have a team of engineers or postdocs to build this instrument. We had a bunch of students. And so the team here is basically an early generation of graduates, uh, of students, <coughs> Um, who st has started with me as early as their first and second years in college. We're talking about 18, 19 year old students who would come in, no background at all in anything hardware, um, and we would tr train them up with this project over multiple summers, and they ended up being the ones who literally did build this instrument, from design stage to fabrication to bringing it to sky. And so, one of the things I like to emphasize is, when I, t when I talk about this instrument with, with um, AO experts, or I'll take it to a conference. I think the instrument is actually pretty impressive, so I'm proud of the instrument. But the thing they're just stunned by is the idea when you look at this list, these are all students and undergraduates without any, um, any engineers or postdocs. So it's a pretty um, remarkable statement about the quality of students we have working on this project and how quickly you can really learn new things. And I think this is the other thing. Um, when I have first year new students coming in, they will look at this instrument and they'll just feel super overwhelmed. Like, I could never do that. I mean, I would have to go to graduate school in 10 years. But in fact, it doesn't take that. It just takes a little bit of focus and perseverance and you can start contributing pretty quickly. And so that's, I think, really empowering. Um, the senior faculty are myself, Scott Severson at Sonoma State, Christoph Bernick and Reed, um, Riddle at Caltech, formerly Caltech, now at Hawaii. And then we do have an engineer, um, Eric Spute, um, but again, um, there's, there's not, most of the work was really done by our students. Um, okay, let me just kind of put name, faces to names because I really think it's important to kind of recognize the work that these students have done. And it really has been um, multiple summaries of teams of three, four, five students really kind of learning to work collaboratively. So at first we didn't know what, what, what would happen here. We brought in our first couple students and we really had no idea if we could do the thing that we claimed we could do because we didn't really know what students were capable of at the time. But you can kind of, now that I look back on this and I think about where all these students are, graduate school PhD programs in astronomy, engineering, um, SpaceX, space flight centers, Berkeley, Lockheed, these students have really kind of taken this experience and transformed it into really fascinating careers, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is my last student slide, <clears throat> but I just want to also say, you know, often we will kind of advocate for our students, but I will, we won't actually say what they did and we kind of sweep it under the rug. This is my org chart. So this is the design, the prototyping, the fabrication, and the operation. All of those phases were really, I sometimes still don't even believe, but all kind of trained and developed by our students. Um, 
The one piece they did not do, and I don't think they could do, is design the software control for the AO system. That's the part that you really do need engineering expertise, and that's the part that our Caltech collaborators contributed to the project. So um, I won't speak a lot about it, but part of the reason we have this connection to um, the Caltech group is this instrument that I'm going to describe is a sister instrument to an instrument built at Caltech. That instrument is a laser guided system, but very similar to this, except that they use a laser guide star, we use natural guide stars, but we both use the same software to drive the system. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to skip over the project goals because I feel like I've talked a little bit about this and I just want to do a quick introduction to AO. Um, I think maybe some of you have seen these, these, some of these slides, um, but I want to kind of break it down. I, I probably won't spend more than 10 or 15 minutes doing this review, but I really want to kind of think about how we think about AO. I think um, if, uh, for a working definition, it's useful to, uh, to imagine that AO is a technology to correct random optical wavefront distortions in real time. The real time part is important because anytime I, I show this to a computer science body, they'll always be like, why don't you just take all the data and then post process it? Wouldn't it be so much better? Um, and so we'll have a long debate about if that's possible even and what the limitations are. But this is done in hardware. And I think that's, it gives you a huge advantage in a lot of senses, but it also makes things a lot more difficult in, in other ways. But the real time component is important. And again, I just want to give everyone a, like a mental model of what this correction looks like, okay? So I want you to visualize, think about, when I say light, I want you to think about what that means. Most people think about light in one of two ways, either photons kind of traveling through space or kind of wave fronts passing through space. And for the sake of thinking about adaptive optics, I think it's important to choose the right mental model. So the way I'm going to talk about it for the, for, for the sake of, of describing this AO system is I want to think about light kind of as traveling wave fronts passing mm -hmm. through space, okay? Mm -hmm. um, is, this, is this a familiar plot or this? this uh, actually, this, I used that cartoon. This one. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so again, a bit of review, but you have star in space. It's propagating light out in every direction. Don't but, worry, I'm sure that uh, <laughs> going over it again would not, I'm sure I didn't do that great of a okay. job, so. <laughs> So if you're in space and light is traveling for you know, millions of years, it's going to be this kind of uniform uh, plane wavefront that comes through space. Um, can I borrow a sheet of paper, actually? A blank sheet? Uh -huh. I can use one of those, it's fine. And so if you are a space telescope and you observe in space, you get the advantage of trying to image with your system a wavefront that is pl planar and flat. Uh -huh. <laughs> so when you have a plane wavefront coming into your telescope, you get a very crisp, what we call diffraction limited image. Um, unfortunately, as the cartoon shows, in that last nanosecond of its travels, mm -hmm. the uh, astronomical wavefront is going to hit the atmosphere, and then those wavefront gets distorted. And so this visual of kind of a planar wavefront in space compared to yeah. this wavefront that you mm. have to measure on Earth. Mm. Is, is, that's not an analogy, this is really what we're talking mm -hmm. about. Um, the scale of this thickness is um, hundreds of nanometers, roughly. We're, we're on the scale of the wavelength of light, okay? So that's what we're really looking at. And what we're trying to do in our system is measure the shape of these wavefronts. They're going to change all constantly. So measure each one and then flatten it out somehow before you image your star. Mm -hmm. that makes sense? So this visual, we're going to kind of see this repeatedly throughout the next few slides. <laughs> okay, so this is the crumpling phenomena, and this is, uh, it's funny, you kind of come up with these models. Um, you can see this if you go out to Santa Monica, you go stand on the pier, you see these wave fronts that can propagate kind of pretty uniformly, you know, tens, hundreds of miles potentially. And then this model of this, this uh, aberration um, shows up in these wavefronts. So the, it could be playing parallel travel for 100 miles. Once it gets to the shore and you get to different depths, you will see that parts of this wavefront will lag behind, other parts will lead here and here. And so you get this kind of the, the equivalent of the crumpling I just showed you. Mm -hmm. okay? So this is really the model that we're looking at. Um, okay. So just to get another visual of it, um, I think part of the reason this was always really hard for me when I first started learning about AO was because I was thinking about photons. And I had a hard time tracking what happens to photons in the atmosphere. I think if you think about it in terms of these wavefronts, it's a little bit easier. Okay, so this is um, 
kind of a good, this is real data. This is what the, the creator of the moon looks like. And so you can kind of see, really, it's like looking through a ripples on a, on a, on a, on a, on a surface of the pool, right? Mm -hmm. um, constantly changing. And so you need to measure that and correct for that. Okay, I'm going to skip over a couple of slides here, just because uh, a lot of this visual, but I won't talk much about this. This is <laughs> cycle through. Um, okay, that was the atmosphere clear. We're talking about a thin layer, and what you can do is elevate as, as try and elevate above that thin layer, which is why we put telescopes on one of the reasons why I put telescopes on mountaintops. Um, but you're still, as long as you're ground based, you're just still going to deal with some fraction of atmosphere and, and um, moisture in the air. <clears throat> Did you talk much about the source of this of perturbations? Is this something I waved my arms quickly okay. and talked about the index of with index changing with okay. temperature. And I'm just going to kind of couple this one last thing to the, this mental model that we have of, of plane waves coming through. If you think about the atmosphere, um, it's useful to think about the atmosphere as a frozen kind of layer of lots of little pockets of air that have different temperatures and densities and therefore different indices of refraction. What that effectively results in is an atmosphere that kind of acts like a whole bunch of lenses of different size and focal lengths that are kind of suspended in air, okay? If those lenslets were frozen, it didn't move at all, you would get a distortion, but it wouldn't change, right? So the other thing that I want to be mindful of is, just like my photon model made it really hard for me to get my head around this, my model of the atmosphere is constantly changing and molecules bumping around. That was also part of the challenge. That's not the way to think about the atmosphere. The way to think about the atmosphere is all these suspended lenslets, the lenslets aren't changing, they're just moving across your telescope, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So what you're really trying to do is characterize the, the, the scale of these lenslets and then uh, make some correction for them, okay? Um, I won't say too much more about it except that in this model, you can imagine, if, you ha if this is kind of your plane wavefront, if you have lots and lots of lenses of different size and, and, and shape, um, an index of refraction, you're going to imagine getting this very kind of messy wavefront. If you imagine your lenslets, though, are really large, um, then you're going to get something that's much, much easier to handle. And so this is um, something you can correct for. This is much trickier. And so we characterize these things by, well, what's the characteristic length over which these wave fronts that are coming in are pretty uniform, okay? So the details of this, I'm, I'm not going to say anything else about. Now though that we have a mental model of light propagating through space and of what the atmosphere is doing, um, I just want to introduce Gemini North, so this is in, in, in Hawaii. Um, I just love looking at this. <laughs> and so this is this is a um, telescope, I don't know, 13, I guess they have 14,000 feet above sea level. So you get above a large fraction of your perturbing atmosphere, but you still have to deal with kind of a thin layer still. And the reason I'm showing this is because, have you, um, you may have seen this, there's a really good visual description of the AO system on the Gemini telescope. So have you all seen this before? Is this? No. Okay, so this is an animation of the Gemini AO system. And I think it really gives a good visual um, and a description of what these AO systems are doing. So what we're going to see here is you're going to see light from a single star propagating in, being captured by this telescope, and focused down to a point. Okay? Mm -hmm. Normally, you would just put your CCD at the focal plane, and you'd get a beautiful image of a star. What this animation is going to show is um, taking that light, propagating it through an adaptive optic system, and then showing how that correction is working. Okay? So I'll let you watch this, and I'll play it again. I just want to absorb this. So that would be the focal plane when you put your CCD. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> There's a twinkle. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. What a great That's illustration. Right. It makes you hungry for potato chips. Too. What about sprinkles? Pancakes. Pancakes. <laughs> I would have loved to have made now this illustration. Now watch the screen. Boop. Boop. <laughs> Very cool. So it really is just flattening of Pringles. That's all AO is. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to walk through this um, again, just to kind of describe the parts of this system. Let's see. Now. Okay. So um, we saw. After your focal plane, you're going to recollimate this light, and these are going to be your distorted wavefronts, so you're getting distorted by the atmosphere. You will hit your deformable mirror, and in this case, as the illustration shows, we're not running the system. So this deformable mirror is just flat. So your Pringles go in, Pringles come out. Um, <laughs> you split that light up into, let's say, a red wavelength and a blue wavelength. It doesn't matter. You just have to split some of it off to sample the, the light. And what's happening here that's not shown is there's a wavefront sensor here. And I think you, some of you may have talked about shock carbon wavefront sensors. That's exactly what we use in our system. Um, I'll say, I can say a little bit more about those, but really, let's call this a black box. The black box is going to measure the shape of the Pringles. The, that information is going to get fed back to the formal mirror that will then for, therefore correct for that shape. Okay? Once you close the loop, you will feed that back up to the formal mirror. <coughs> and make the necessary correction. Um, there's a lot in here, but it's actually pretty straightforward. When you look at it as a cartoon, it makes a lot of sense. It's, it's actually just a small step to go from here to our actual system. Um, are there any questions about this? Because I feel like, uh, yeah. How big are these systems? Yeah, that's a great question. So our system, you'll see, sits on a one meter by one meter optical bench. Um, they can get much, much larger, but in our case, our deformable mirror is about four millimeters on a side. You can certainly build bigger deformable mirrors, um, and you can do this at this correction at different places. Some people actually try and do this at the secondary mirror, so that's obviously a big you know, 10, 12, 15, 16 inch mirror. Um, but in our case, and in many cases, you'll kind of shrink the beam down and make your correction on millimeters to centimeter scales, typically. What kind of time scales are relevant here? I mean, because you're detecting um, the existence of uh, distortion effectively, and then you have to react to it. That's right. So that's a great question. So I'm going to spend a couple. I'm going to spend uh, some time thinking about that because the way the system is, the way this is drawn, this doesn't seem like it would work, right? I'm measuring or the distortion on this wavefront, and then I'm going to send this question back. Even if it's instantaneous, I'm going to be correcting for a wavefront, you know, five wavefronts down. So the key to this cartoon is that these wavefronts can't change very much um, on the time scale that you're making these corrections. So this is why it's important to think about the atmosphere. So now what matters is how fast, I said imagine a static atmosphere if it's frozen and it's not moving, then nothing changes and you can correct for it once and you're good. There's a velocity of, of, of that frozen atmosphere. And so the velocity will drive how quickly you have to make these adjustments. The time scales are typically on the order of hundreds of hertz, and so you have to work two to three times faster than that. So this system wants to work at a kilohertz. A thousand times a second, you want to make a measurement and a correction. Yeah. Do you uh, always measure the wavefront after the correction? In this system, we do, but there are other systems where you would actually make that measurement right here. Yeah. And that seems more intuitive, right? Like you yeah. should make the, make the measurement and then make a correction. The reason I like this approach is because you're actually measuring the residuals you're measuring residuals and so if you imagine that this deformation is ch changing slowly with time then what happens is once you make your first correction and you correct that um, apply some distortion to your deformer mirror then you, you should be looking at mostly flat wavefronts after that and as they start to depart from flat then you can make small adjustments to the deformer mirror if you do it here you don't get that feedback mm -hmm. that's a great question mm -hmm. but but there are systems that try and do it beforehand. There are advantages to that as well. It just means you really have to trust your system. Mm -hmm. And this kind of gives you a little feedback to it's a little cheat, I say. You mentioned you were going to tell us about the wavefront sensor. Yes. Um, let's see. Well, <laughs> I will tell you about that. Um, okay. I'll jump to that towards the end. But, but, but I've turned a couple slides. Uh, any other questions before I move on? 
All right. So then you want to see the result, obviously. So you flatten your wave fronts, and you get your um, nice diffraction-limited core. So this is kind of, if this telescope were in space, you would see something like this, um, maybe without the flicker. OK. This is not my data, but this is you know, somewhere off the web. An example of, I think this might even be a lab test, to be honest. But the basic idea is you're going to get this speckle pattern. And this is the twinkle that you see when you look at any star through a, through a, through a telescope. Before correction and after correction. This is a one arc second kind of um, seeing limited star. And you can see two things. You can see that there is a speckling that's happening. But there's also this slow drift of the star just kind of moving around and wandering. And so this is obviously accelerated, but both of those components are important. Um, and you have to credit for both of them separately. Just another illustration here. This is the um, uncorrected, uncorrected image and corrected image. And just to help us with our visuals, this is what that wave front would look like. If you measure it properly, you can change the shape of your correcting mirror. And this will be the outcoming wave front. Okay? So, mm -hmm. I'll point one thing out, you still see there's a lot of high spatial frequency stuff happening here. And if you look carefully, you can see there's still this kind of like speckling or in, the, in a ring out here. That's what's driving that, that kind of stuff out there. Would the sample rate, uh, if you doubled it to 2KC, would it make uh, a difference in the outgoing wavefront? Um, in this case, it wouldn't help this problem. Mm -hmm. um, because you don't have the spatial resolution just to make that measurement. So this is happening because you can see this <coughs> correcting mirror is a smooth version of whatever you measure the incoming wave to be. Mm -hmm. And so you need higher resolution uh, wavefront sensor and a higher resolution wow. correcting mirror. Yeah. Something I think it might be worth saying a word or two about is not only with the corrected image are you uh, having better spatial um, correction to where you can centroid where that is, that sort of thing, but also how much efficiency you get just by concentrating that spread wave uh, focus into uh, a smaller area. That's right. So I'm going to show a couple of our, our, our results slides where you'll be able to see that. So th that's a good point. So I just want to restate that is not only are you getting good resolution here, but you know here there's one star. So if I, if I measure all this flux here, as opposed to here, it's still just one star. If I were looking at a binary star, then I'd be able to resolve it. But in a lot of cases, the, the benefit here is that you can actually get, um, a, since you're concentrating all of your light, if there are faint sources around that you wouldn't have seen, um, those things will start to pop out because you're really concentrating your light. Mm -hmm. back. And I'll show some slides of that right there. OK, so that's actually my 10-minute AR introduction. Um, any questions about that before we shift gears? Yeah. So back to what I asked you before, so what about software post-processing? Um, you know, I, I see most of what you want to do is, is going to be in, in the hardware here, mm -hmm. but um, if you're uh, sort of having to react on the level of um, thousands of a second or, or so, um, can you go back and, um, and process the last several wavefronts based on the information that you there are, there, so I'm not, there, there, are, there are definitely tricks you can play and replace some of them. So you can, you know, you could just take this as your output, but we don't do that. We take this, um, what we'll end up doing is we'll take um, high resolution imaging of this. We don't quite work at a thousand hertz because it's actually hard to do that. Um, cameras just, yeah, it's, it's, you just, it's, it's not a trivial matter. Um, nowadays it's becoming more possible, but we will put a high speed imager on the back here and then we will post process our imaging as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. It's called lucky imaging. Is that, I don't know if that's a familiar mm -hmm. term, but you can lucky image by itself and you can also lucky image on the back end coupled to the AO system and you can, you can um, those two put together certainly improve your image quality as well. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's exactly what you were talking about, but, there, but, but certainly you yeah. could do some of this in the full plan. Okay, um, now I want to, so that was all just AO, I want to talk about our instrument a little bit and um, our facility. So we are working in Wrightwood, California. We have a one meter telescope. This is our observatory. It's at a JPL facility, Table Mountain facility. Um, it's around 7,000 feet. What's the elevation here? 
67. 67. Okay, so pretty similar. Um, it's only about less than an hour away from Wrightwood, especially at 3 in the morning when you're trying to get home. <laughs> <laughs> um, reasonably dark skies, given that we're in LA, in the LA basin. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll show that. And we can get up with arc second and a half scene is, is, is reasonable. And so this is a night, this is an older um, image I took, but you can see that there's a very big difference being Claremont versus Wrightwood. And so the dark skies certainly do help a little bit. They're getting worse and worse every year. But um, the other key for us is um, there are staff in Wrightwood all the time. This is a JPL facility. But we don't want to have to trek up there every time we want to do observations. And so we have, because it's a, by nature of it being a JPL facility, we have fast communications. And so we're able to do a lot of our observing remotely. And so this. This is our um, on-site, in Claremont, remote observing facility. And so we have kind of everything set up here where we can just remotely log on to every machine that's inside this dome. And we have a couple of nest cameras here that kind of monitor the telescope um, so we don't drive it into the pier. And so students can come in and just observe for a couple of hours, um, go back to their homework. And this is the thing that's made this possible. If we had to drive up to Brighton every time, there's no way we could actually try and achieve this kind of, of, of program. Um, if you haven't been up to Wrightwood, um, this is just a snap, an aerial view of the JPL site. I'm sure I wasn't supposed to take this image, but I think <laughs> um, This right here is the 20, TM23, which is our one meter telescope. Is that a new telescope? Um, yeah, let's see. This telescope was built, started in the mid-90s by a former professor at, um, at Pomona College, mm. um, Bob Chambers, and it was kind of handed off to the next professor. It just kind of got handed off to me. Not fully, I would say, hardware was in place. The software was still kind of a, a decade-long project to, to be able to do. My contribution has really been trying to contribute the back-end hardware, which is the AO instrument. Because they had a, did, didn't they have a, uh, I don't know, 48-inch uh, for tracking satellites? Yes, so in this dome, there are multiple telescopes in here. They do a lot of satellite, um, LIDAR observations, satellite tracking observations, asteroid tracking observations. And so, there's a, I think there's a solar telescope here. It looks like that. It's open. Um, and I think the 48 used to be in this dome. They've taken that down and they've replaced it with a new, I think it's a one or one and a half meter telescope they're still kind of installing right now. Oh. Okay. Um, and so this is, our, this, is our, this is our telescope. So I want to motivate a little bit um, the need for AO. Because sometimes it's unclear to people, well, why do you even bother with this? We have HST, you can get super high quality imaging from space. And so um, I, my background is in Santa Cruz. And so I, I, I took classes from Jerry Nelson who designed Keck instruments, Keck telescopes. And I was always curious about this. Why the investment? And so what I've shown here is a plot that shows time versus telescope aperture diameter. I think this is useful for historical reference, right? So if you look, we start with the naked eye, Galileo's telescope, we kind of march through time and telescopes get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so I think the motivation for developing the adaptive optics, so there's a center for adaptive optics at Santa Cruz, and it's an NSF funded facility, um, research center, and I think that the main reason that they proposed that site was not so they could just get high resolution imaging, it was so they could justify this telescope, the TMT. So I'm gonna explain what, that, what I mean by that. So this is the aperture size here, which, and this is the theoretical resolution limit based on the aperture size. So the bigger telescope you have, the better resolution you can theoretically get, okay? So the eye is down here, and then you march up, up this plot. Unfortunately, because of your atmospheric limits, your seeing limit is anywhere between, let's say, multiple arc seconds to, let's say, half an arc second in the best case scenario if you're in a mountaintop in Chile or Hawaii, our California 7,000 feet gets us around an arc second or so, best case scenario. And so really, yeah, that just kills everything, right? <laughs> you can collect more photons here, but I argue that with my one meter telescope, with 300 nights in my one meter telescope, I have about um, the same data light, light photon collecting power as a few nights on the Keck 10 meter telescope. 
and it's just that I spread that over an entire year. So the photon collection has obviously helped, but the resolution is limited by the atmosphere. And so it's very hard back in the early 2000s when we had just built the 10 meter telescope to justify building this 30 meter telescope if you could not somehow deal with this problem. And so the development of AO I think was critical to demonstrate that yes, once we build this, we're actually gonna not only increase our collecting ability, but we'll also increase our resolution limits. And I don't think with that, without it, I don't think that you would have ever been able to justify that next generation of telescope. You know? So for TMO, that's our one, a nice little one meter telescope. We can, if we do this properly, elevate above every other ground based non AO system. So this <laughs> was kind of the pitch. <clears throat> Um, again, just to kind of further justify why we do this over when we have JWST and HST. So this is a snapshot of the Keck 10 meter telescope, not fully filled in yet. And this is JWST, so comparable, roughly 10 meter versus six-ish meters. Mm -hmm. um, but when we're looking at the next generation telescope, we're talking about something that's like this, right? So this is the TMT scale, clearly not 2018 anymore. <laughs> um, but and you can see that for ground-based telescopes, if you want to get to the diffraction theoretical limit, you have to deal with the atmospheric turbulence. Okay? So that's kind of some motivation in the background. All right, with that said, I want to, talk, I want to switch gears and talk about our instrument. So this is the design and, um, of, our, of our test bed, of, no, of our instrument. Um, and this is our actual instrument. A little messier, not as pretty, not as colorful, but it's all there, I promise you. And so I want to re remind folks that this design, the SOLIDWORKS modeling, all this CAD modeling, students, all of it. I couldn't do this if you asked me to. Um, this is our, our, our bench in the lab. I'm not going to walk through all the different components because it's just a little bit messy and, and, and um, probably not worth the time, but I will kind of walk through some of our, um, some of the different components here. So, some of the early stage development you have to do is kind of this optical design and so a student here has gone and laid out all the instruments knowing what image quality he wanted he actually had to go and model all these different optical components and make predictions about what your your image quality would look like at different phases um, and another student working on the Fletcher modeling so here I, I, I suspect I might have some engineers in the room um, this is again not something I've done. When you're talking about suspending this instrument under our telescope and then shifting um, all over the sky, this is um, a one inch thick breadboard. The bolt pattern we found mattered a lot. So you can't just suspend this thing and think that you know, if you have tens of microns of Fletcher that you're still gonna get a good image. And so we had to kind of go through experimentation to look at different mounting patterns. So not the um, uh, sexiest work, but really critical for, for this kind of project. Okay, and then to go back even further, just in the design of the system, we had to go and simulate um, the AO system, figuring out on what scale we would need to make corrections. Um, and so this is showing you this shock carbon wavefront sensor um, and predicting what an open loop versus closed loop uh, um, correction would do. This was done five years before we put anything on sky. So this was really the very first thing we had to do to figure out if we could um, build this instrument. Okay. I'm gonna skip this, this is just more predictions, so I can get to first slide. So this is now us, multiple years of engineering and, and fabrication to get on sky. And so this was a couple of years, a couple of summers ago now. Um, this is our first observing group that, that took the, the instrument to sky. And so this black box here is mounted on the back of our one meter telescope. And, and I don't know if you can see, what happens is if you take this board and you invert it, light's gonna come through that opening and they get folded into the plane of this, of this breadboard. And so light's just kind of traveling around inside here, okay? Um, let me, yeah, yeah, question. Um. Well, again, um, I see in your in your setup you do use a tip tilt mirror. You might comment uh, why you would have a separate tip tilt mirror as opposed to just taking out the, uh, the 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 tip and the tilt of the wavefront with the uh, with the AO or with the right. DM. Okay, so let me let me walk through this beam path on the on the simulation because it's, it's I think mean, it's cleaner here. So light comes in and uses a flat mirror. 
Um, anything, any place where you see OAP, that's an off-axis parabola. That's basically just a, uh, a powered optic of some kind, not, not unlike your eyeglass lens. Um, the active components I'll point out here. So you come in, you pass through your focal plane where you would normally just image, put your CCD, and you hit your first optic that collimates your light. Okay, so you go from an expanding beam, um, diverging beam, to a collimated beam through here and you will um, apply this first tip tilt correction. So that's to kind of steady your star and lock it in place. Um, after that, you'll send that through the rest of the system, another powered optic, another powered optic, hit your deformable mirror. This is gonna take care of all your speckling and concentrate all your kind of little speckles into a single um, core. You'll go to another powered optic, and then <coughs> from here, we go through two beam splitters. So the first beam sensor will send light to this wavefront sensor. This is our Shack Hartman wavefront sensor. This will sense the wavefront and then feed the deformable mirror. So then at this point, everything that's going onwards, once we've closed this loop, should be a corrected high resolution image. And so what we do is we send light to two cameras, one near infrared camera, so long wavelengths, and then we fold light back around here to another science imaging camera, which is your um, optical imaging camera. This is our high speed camera. This can work at 30 hertz, which doesn't sound super fast, but for a scientific mm. instrument, that's pretty fast. And we're used to imaging on two to 10 minute time scales. Um, and so it's pointed out that we do this low order correction um, separately from the deformal mirror. There are, I guess there are a few reasons for that. You could try and do this here with the DM at some level, um, but the dr it's driving a lot, and what you typically don't have here is enough throw to make the kinds of mm. drift corrections you need. So this has a much larger range um, than the deformable mirror. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you've got near infrared and optical using the same corrections. Is that possible because they're, um, they're still relatively close in the wavelength? Yes, that's right. So we're, this beam splitter, okay, the first beam splitter is something like 500 nanometers. So it's having blue light here. And, we, and, and this is a good point. We're correcting based on this blue wavefront. And then it turns out that as you go to longer wavefronts, it's usually easier to correct. And so you correct with the, with the blue wavefront, and then we're sending four, you know, five to 700 microns here, and then 700, to, 700 nanometers, sorry, to one micron here. And Generally speaking, as you go longer, it, it gets generally easier. You have less, less um, mm. structure in your wavefronts. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to zip back to where we were. OK, so this is our open loop observation of, I guess, beta peg was one of these first objects. And you can see there's a lot of jumping around. This is. Um, this is not quite a movie. I would call this more of a time lapse, right? So we're missing frames here, so the, the jumping is not as severe as this. But you can see there's clearly drift, as well as the speckling that we're seeing. So the tip tilt will remove the drift, and the high high resolution um, spatial resolution deformable mirror will correct the speckling that we have there. So I'm going to close loop now. I hope, and there we go. So now this is on sky with our one meter telescope. So now you're seeing um, this core where you try, you try to put all of your light into the core and you want to get something that's diffraction limited as we say. Um, and so to first order we've made that correction and we have a diffraction limited kind of theoretical limit core. And now what we're looking at is, again, there's still kind of uh, activity in the halo um, that you'll constantly be finding. But this is our first look first light observation, so we're trying to just now fine tune that. But the, the two main things, the drift we've removed, and we've really concentrated our light into the core. Um, for the experts in the room, we're getting Strel ratios in the optical of order um, 0.3 or 30 to 40%. So what that means is, if we used to with a seeing limited image, so um, when this goes to open, in this phase, if you looked at kind of a small region in the center, you'd get a few percent of light in that small core. Once you close loop, you're getting something like 30 to 40 percent of the light into that core. So it's a, you know, um, not a few percent improvement. It's many um, factor improvement in terms of the concentration. So if you just want to do a comparison, this is what kind of a smoothed out image would look like if I took a long 
let's say, few second integration, you might see something that looked like this, or maybe, um, and then, but a longer integration with our closed loop is, is something like this. And so you can see here, this is what surface profiles look like. Seeing limiter, you see a lot of light in our core. This is um, uncorrected. And if you only, if you really want to build um, a, a, a a poor man's version of this, you could just remove the tip tilt and get a lot of your, a lot of improvements just with that first order correction. And so if you just do that, you can, you can already get some improvement. Um, just to kind of quantify this a little bit, this is what a profile would look like. So your red is your seeing limited profile. Um, and the blue is showing you how much you're kind of moving light from the wings here into that core. Okay, and that's what we measure, and that's what we're trying to characterize when we look at this scroll ratios. <coughs> I'm going to skip over a couple of these plots just to show some more results. Um, the statement was made earlier that not only do we really want to improve the resolution, but really what we're trying to do is pull out sources from the background. Mm -hmm. and so here's an example of this. This is a trapezium <coughs> cluster. And so you can see that, you know, for bright stars using a bright saturated, we could certainly, if we zoomed in, see that there was uh, an improvement in our kind of light distribution, but what you can see much more readily is that these kind of smeared out fainter stars just pop right up because you're concentrating that light much better. Mm -hmm. And so, they're different, depending on what your science applications are, this may or may not matter so much for you. Okay. Mm. I'm gonna skip over some of these results slides, they're not super critical. Um, I do wanna focus on this one though, because there was a question about, can you do post-processing? Mm -hmm. And so this is showing you, let's just focus on one of these. Let's just look at the top panel. What this is showing you is a time series of images that we would take with our science camera. And what you find is that um, with, so these are a bunch of images, and this is basically looking at how sharp your image is or how sharp your star is. So what you see is when you are um, in open loop or not without the system, you get these kind of not very sharp images, something like this. Once you turn the system on, you get much more concentrated images like this, okay? But you can see there's a lot of variance here. And so one of the things you can do in post-processing, the lucky part of this, is you can just go ahead and take the subset, let's say the 10% best images, and stack those things together to really kind of get this extra, you know, 20% improvement. Um, and so this is, this, this is the lucky component of, of this process. Okay. Um, there's a question about shock carbon wavefront sensing, and so I'm just going to. I have two slides on this, and I think you've hopefully seen these before. This is straight. This is a really nice Thor Labs tutorial. I think it's a really useful visual because if you imagine this wavefront again, so imagine this is the flat version of my wavefront. If this were to hit a lens, then that lens would take this flat wavefront and and, and focus it to a spot, right? If instead of a single lens, though, I had a grid of, let's say, 10 by 10 little lenslets, or 100 lenslets that this thing was hitting, then instead of getting a single spot, you'd get a 10 by 10 grid of spots, 100 spots, okay? If this wavefront that's flat hits that lenslet array, you're going to get a uniform grid of spots, right? Once I do this, what ends up happening is my grid of spots basically becomes, um, is no longer uniform, because what happens is, Every part of my wavefront has some slope introduced to it, and if in instead of coming in flat, it comes in at some with some slope or some angle, your focus spot is going to get shifted on your on your chip. Okay, so this is basically what we do here. So we have a lenslet array. Um, in our case, we use about a, a 12 by 12 lenslet array, and we create this grid of spots here. When we um, introduce some deformation. Um, then what happens is these spots get shifted all around and the, the, the software is basically measuring positions of these spots, taking these positions, converting it back to a measurement of the slope, and then from all these different slope measurements, reconstructing a wavefront. Okay? Mm -hmm. And again, this is just a zoom of looking at the difference between a flat planar wavefront versus something that has some tilt. So really the measurement is not measuring the entire wavefront at once, in this case, you're basically just trying to sample the slopes at different parts of your wavefront and then reconstruct the entire wavefront from that. And so this is an example of what this might look like on sky. So this here is an open loop image and this is a closed loop image. I should point out this was one of our early systems, so this is why the quality doesn't look quite as good as the data I just showed you. This was our first generation instrument that we built. 
But the thing I wanted to show was these two um, images that come off our wavefront sensor. So here you see these spots, these kind of, um, um, the spots are kind of in a grid-like pattern. But what this is showing you is that these spots are falling on individual pixels, and you're seeing kind of a non-uniform grid here. It's a little hard to see because it looks pretty uniform, but what we really, the way we designed the system is we want every single spot to land at the intersection of, of four pixels. And so when you have that, you should have, if all of your spots are at the intersections of, of pixels, then you should have a completely uniform um, image here. And you don't because you're not landing at that intersection. And so once you close the loop, you get a kind of an, an, um, an image that's much smoother. And that shows that you have a more uniform grid of, of spots. So basically, on every sub-aperture, you're, you're taking as basically a quad side. Right? That's right. That's exactly what we're doing. Um, and again, this is just another illustration of that. This is looking at the reconstructed phase map, but let me, let me, let me skip over these things because I want to get to um, the last thing I want to talk about, and I only have a couple minutes, so <laughs> I'll kind of, I'll, I'll end the Kapow component with a couple of takeaways, just to kind of let you know what the status is, and the, for, for the next phase, since we're operating on Sky, we're now looking at doing two things. We're interested in doing some science, first of all, with the, with the instrument, but also because the instrumentation part was actually a lot of fun, we're looking at kind of next steps in terms of hardware development or experimentation in lab. And so we're kind of taking this two-pronged approach. Um, in the last couple of minutes, I'm gonna switch gears completely and just pitch one, one, one last idea. And again, now we have to switch away from this high spatial resolution imaging and I want to just pitch, this is a project that some of my students are working on right now in collaboration with a group at JPL to do a survey, a blind survey for faint asteroids in the night sky. And so let's see if I can show this. So has anyone seen this video before? Has anyone not seen this video before? Okay, if, you, if anyone hasn't seen it, I'll, 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 I'll just let it run because it's, it's fantastic. So this is just taking the database of known asteroids. Oops. Uh, let's see. This is taking the database of known asteroids from I don't know um, asteroid uh, uh, Lowell, I believe it is, and visualizing those location their locations and their discovery dates. So what you see in the bottom left is a date, and that's the number of known asteroids. And you're going to see as this runs this. As time continues, you're going to see this is the discovery. Every flash you see is the discovery of a new asteroid. And you can see how we went from tens of thousands to, I don't know what the final number is, but we're approaching millions of sources now. Um, you can see the little the blue circle, the blue dots there are, are planets. Um, if you didn't know that Earth was searching the sun, you could see it here because the Earth is orbiting around. You can see that all these asteroids are being observed, kind of connected to the Earth here. And so these are. Um, all sky surveys that are being being operated um, from the Earth. There's a lot of really interesting stuff to, to see in this video, and so I encourage you to go and just Google this. There are lots of high resolution versions of this. But the thing I'm going to point out is there's some color coding here. The green we have green asteroids here, we have yellow asteroids, and we have red asteroids. The red asteroids weren't really in this movie at the beginning in, in 1999, but as we progress in time, you're gonna see the population of red asteroids is, is, is increasing a lot. Those red asteroids are the near-Earth yeah. asteroids that are potential kind of, um, um, have, have the potential to impact the Earth, okay? So there's been a lot of study, I feel like, or a lot of funding in this area to really map out this population of objects there. And so this is kind of what this project is going towards, is trying to understand what's happening with these near-Earth asteroid population stars, of, of asteroids, sorry. What is that, that light beacon that's coming around? This, this thing, the, the white? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what happens is every, t so <laughs> it's really cool because when you look at this map, you can understand how we're discovering, you can see the different techniques we use to discover these asteroids. Um, I have to back up a, a, a a minute. Let me roll it back to. Yeah. So what's happening is um, there are a 
few big campaigns that will do these asteroid observations. And what you're seeing here is these big data releases where they'll kind of operate this campaign over the course of, let's say, month to month, they'll release new asteroid discoveries, and that's what's lighting, what, that's what's being lit up here in white. And you can kind of see that there's a period in here where there's not much discovery. I think that corresponds to like the rainy season in Arizona. And that's, what you're, that's what you're seeing there. But it's fascinating. And you can see the different techniques come into play at different times. And there are a few different surveys that are introduced here. But the basic idea is just trying to show you the evolution. And so if you thought asteroids were dead and not that interesting, um, and we knew all we needed to know in 1999, you'd be, you'd be you might be surprised to learn that the population has grown by an order of magnitude. Wow. Um, and the other reason I'd say this is super interesting is two things. We want to prevent our demise, naturally. <laughs> but also the other kind of big area of growth is exoplanet research. Right? We really under want to understand how solar systems, not just our own form. And so really the amount of thought that's gone into kind of understanding our solar system um, has really kind of escalated in the past decade, I would say, as we started thinking more and more about exoplanets and connecting the research of our own solar system to exosolar planetary systems. So could you explain the title of that, The Blind Observations? Yes. So here is the, here is the cool oh, part of, okay, this, of this technique, and this is what I wanted to get to. Okay. So the Kapow project was looking at high resolution. What this is going to do is use high time cadence observations to try and find these things. So let me tell you how asteroids are normally found. Normally what you'll do is you will take a long exposure, and by long exposure it could be a minute, 30 seconds, 15 minutes, whatever. But you pick an exposure and that allows you to get kind of deep observations and what, what happens is that you will track on stars. So when you stack this image, when you take a long exposure, if you're tracking, you're going to get deep images of stars that are point-like. But anything that's moving is going to be a, a, um, a streak. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of, of asteroids that have been discovered have been discovered by this method. The problem with this method is you have to be a bright enough asteroid and or moving slowly enough that you will show up as a streak. So you can imagine if you had a fainter asteroid, then what will happen here is if, if I have a faint asteroid that's moving across my image, then when I stack my image or take a low exposure, it's going to get hidden in the background, right? And so that's why we're kind of limited to big, bright objects. We're interested in these near-Earth asteroids that could be of order, you know, tens of, tens of meters across. Um, and, so, and, 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 and because they're close to Earth, they end up being much faster moving. So you're, it's kind of double whammy, smaller and fast. And so what you do here is, if you knew there was a side, a, an asteroid in your field, and you knew the direction it was moving, what you could do is just take a whole series of images, and then just shift, in the, shift your images in the direction of the motion, combine them, and get a nice image here. Right? The problem is, this is a blind survey. We don't know if they're there. If they're there, we don't know where they're moving or how fast they're moving. So what we do is we just sit here and stare at the sky, takes lots of short exposures, and then shift and combine in lots of different directions with lots of different speeds. So this all happens in post-processing. And every once in a while, if there happens to be an object moving in the direction where we kind of guessed, mm -hmm. then it'll pop up as a signal. Okay? Mm -hmm. So this is really time-intensive work. But it's mostly time-intensive computer work, right? And so you just kind of feed the software, the, the, these, these frames, and you just let it chug away, and every once in a while you'll get a ding-ding-ding. Um, so this is what we're calling synthetic tracking. This is not my, I don't, I don't want to take credit for this. I'm running, I'm helping to run the observational side of this project, but a lot of this development is all happening at JPL. And so we have a pretty big team of, of software developers and engineers who are working on this. We are providing a lot of the observational support um, for this program. But because we're providing the support, what that translates into is a really good project, again, for students who can jump on really quickly. It doesn't take very long to train a student to run a telescope. You know, maybe three, four sessions a month in, and you can get these students kind of up and running and running this kind of observing program. And so these are actually first year, second year students who just kind of come in, know nothing all about astronomy necessarily, but they're getting a chance to kind of run our meter telescope and run this JPL observing program. And so it's kind of a, it's an exciting project, and it's kind of the thing that's distracted me a little bit from the Kapow project. But it's kind of a fun project, and so I wanted to just mention it briefly.
-hmm. Okay, so now I know that I'm over time, so I want to apologize, first of all, but also open up for questions if there are any. What's the acronym, Capel? Um, <laughs> so, oh, man, the, the number of person hours that went to that acronym. Um, Is it the Chanel Mon? You guys eat there a lot? Ah, we do eat there all the time, but it's not from there. Um, is there actually a dish? There's Kapow chicken. Okay, okay. No, so the, the, the name Kapow actually, the PAO is Pomona Adaptive Optics. And we spent a lot of time forgetting out how to Pow is, it's not quite known. So we wanted to kind of illustrate that it was students developed. And so we had like, we had an S in there and that didn't really work out. So one of my students was like, oh, could it be Kid Assembled, Pomona oh. <laughs> so, But that was a, little, so it was a little disparaging, so we didn't actually, that's not officially what it is, but that was one of the <laughs> motivations for running with Kapow. So Kapow is actually a self, it's self-referencing. So it's Kapow, the K is for Kapow. Kind of like GNU, which is not Unix. GNU, not Unix. It's a self-referencing. Okay. <laughs> Good question. Um, what exactly, how, how exactly do you mechanically deform the mirror in, yeah. order for, in adaptive optics? Sure, that's a great question. So I'm going to see if I can get a picture, or I don't think I have a picture. Mm -hmm. um, you say it's happening at 30 hertz? Um, about a 500 to a kilohertz. Oh. Okay. 500 hertz to a kilohertz. So the DM in here is, some, it's right here, and you can see it's, it's a 4.4 4 <coughs> millimeter millimeter um, mirror. And so it really is just this very thin, flexible mirror that's uh, aluminum or silver coated, gold coated in, in this case. And what you have on the back of this four millimeter mirror is a bunch of piezo actuators that are attached to the mirror. And so you can push and pull all of these little actuators to deform the mirror. Um, and I'll say the mirror is four millimeters across and the amount of push or pull is probably of order hundreds of nanometers. And so, if they're really small deformations, but you can clearly see that um, in the microphone. Yeah, and how many South Africa, or how many actuators can you run? Um, we run, um, it's an 11 by 11 system. And so we're running everything except for the corners. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, are you doing some science with this, or? Uh Yes. Well, yes and no. <laughs> um, like I, I said, the students or that's right. So, so you know, as I said, my science is mostly extragalactic uh, evolution. But um, we're doing, we're starting to do solar system stuff. And the thing I think that's going to be the bread and butter of the system is binary star studies. Um, we can't get down to the brightness limits where we'd be able to do exoplanet work, for instance. That's kind of the realm of space telescopes. Um, what we can do, though, is look for binaries, and we can do monitoring programs. So our telescope, because we have dedicated 350 nights a year, we can do lots of kind of monitoring programs. And so what we'd like to do is high-resolution imaging of binary systems um, and do kind of a characterization of nearby or bright star systems to really lock down kind of the binary fractions. And so, again, it's not the most, um, it's, it's not necessarily the highest profile work, but it's actually become really important as we're starting to learn and think more about exoplanets and formation of solar systems. One of these, in that, in, in that context, it's really important to understand what fraction of stars are in binary systems as opposed to triple systems and what that kind of evolution is like. And so that's the main long-term science we're hoping to work on. There are other things like solar system studies that we can do. So I have a student right now who's building a catalog for me. Of um, So one thing I didn't mention is the natural guide, the con of the natural guide star is that you need a bright reference star. So we're talking about something like ninth or 10th magnitude or brighter. So that really limits the percentage of sky you can sample. Um, so, but the solar system is really great because star, things in the solar system are constantly moving, right? And so one thing that we have um, students looking into is, well, let's say I want to go and observe Pluto, um, or I want to resolve moons around, around Pluto, let's say. I can't necessarily run my AO system on Pluto, it's not bright enough, but Pluto's moving all the time. And so what I have a student working on like tonight is trying to cross-correlate objects in the solar system with the bright with bright star catalogs and letting me know when you're going to necessarily have a close enough passage you could actually get that AO mm -hmm. correction. Mm -hmm. And how close is close enough? In our case, you probably want to be about 10 to 20 arc seconds away. Mm -hmm. You can get a correction. Our field of view is bigger than that, but if you really want to get a good correction, 10 to 20 arc seconds will work. Mm -hmm. 
so yeah, it's still small. <laughs> and the uh, the high speed camera is is just to characterize how the system is working, or do you average a lot of frames, or? So this is our optical high speed camera, and this this only runs at about 30 hertz, but that's full frame science, right. um, low readout noise system. Um, the highest frame rate camera is this wavefront sensor. This is the thing that has to run into kilohertz to sample your wavefronts. Um, is that what you were asking about? No, I was asking as far as using the data, you take 30 frames a second, oh. do you average those or, or somehow right. process them? So yeah, what we'll do is we will um, either just stack them all, or what we typically do is we will sort them by image quality, take the ones that are the best, and then combine those. So. This gives us uh, this lucky advantage that, 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 um, that some people use just straight away without AO, but since we're doing it on the back of our AO instrument, we'll, we find that we have a large fraction of these images are actually quite good, so we'll just usually just throw away the 20% that happen to be particularly bad and then combine the rest. You mentioned there were advantages and disadvantages to the mechanical method and the laser method. You prefer this method. What are the advantages that you... That's a great question. So the main advantage is, so they're both mechanical. So if I opened up the robo-AO system, which is what the, my collaborators at Caltech have built, it would look almost identical to this. You'd see all the same components. Um, they actually use the same deformer mirror, but you'd also see a little laser buried in here somewhere that was launching and giving them a reference spot. The problem, so I talked about... Um, I think I talked about one of the disadvantages. One of the advantages is when you're using a star or a laser as a beacon, um, you really want that beacon to be as point-like as possible. And so stars are much more point-like than kind of a laser. So when you shine this laser out, you're really not getting a point. You're often getting kind of a cylinder of light that's, that's, that you're using as a reference. And so in the best case scenario, if I am observing a bright star and the Roboeo is observing that same bright star, I will always get a better correction than they do. So for the bright end of things, you can, you'll generally do better with a natural guide star than a laser system. Plus you have a lot of airplanes flying over. That's right. <laughs> it, it turns out their, their system doesn't require a spotter. It's a, it's a really backscattering system, and so it, 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 it works in, in visual wavelengths. You don't, you don't, you're not worried about airplanes? I'm sorry. Not for that, not for their system. Okay. Um, and this was a huge point of contention because they had to go back and forth. They were very concerned about that because they couldn't have a robotic system running, you know, 200 nights a year with a spotter. And so they, they do have to shut down if there are certain satellites going overhead. Um, but that's the only, that's the only thing. So they're connected to the space agency. Mm -hmm. With a laser, are they using the same uh, Shaq Hartman with just a four pixel quad cell or are they having to do cross correlation? Thing? They are doing the same thing. They're just ah. doing, they're, they're doing the same thing as us. And so. so that's part of the reason they're, they're not able to get as good of a wavefront correction. That's right. So I, that's a good point. So this is the thing about, there's, um, I guess, differences in the way you would do kind of solar AO or extended objects AO as opposed to kind of the naive way that, that nighttime astronomers would often just do, let's pick a point source and use that as a, as a reference. So yeah, so I'm really interested to know, think more about some of these subtleties, because as I said, I'm still a novice in this instrumentation game. So. In the Shaq Cartman, um, if, if I understand correctly, if if the image is not deviated, it's going to fall on the intersection of the four pixels. Right. So all that's happening then, if I understand, is that if it falls into pixel number one, it could be anywhere across that pixel number one. Mm -hmm. And so the correction is arbitrarily already determined. It's predetermined. If we get a light in pixel one, we're going to deform the mirror by X amount. Yes. There's no analog there at all, is there? Well, it's a quad sensor. Pardon? That, well, but the pixel has a certain size to it. Size to it. Right. So regardless of where it is in that pixel, mm -hmm. the deformation of the mirror is going to be preset. Um, well, so that's a good question. So, okay, so let me just see if I understand this. Um, mm -hmm. Let's imagine Maybe that... This yeah, this might be. Yeah, it's, it's uh, Right. And so... You do, uh, you do a triple A on the quad sensor. So if these are my four pixels here, and let's imagine that they're these four pixels, let's yeah, say, yeah. right around okay. here, most of the light's concentrated in one of these pixels, 
And so what you're really doing is you're measuring the light in, you're basically, just to make the math fast, you're basically summing these two and summing these two and taking a ratio of them. Okay. And then you're going to end up sh applying, there is an analog shift, but you have to, um, depending on what that ratio is. So if, all of, if it's complete of all the lights in here, then you would make a big shift. But if you, depending on what that ratio is, you might make more sense. From that, you get all kinds of variations. I see that. That's right. Now I have one more question. Mm -hmm. On that last way of detecting, your most current way, mm -hmm. you're, you're looking for super dim asteroids. Okay? Yes. And so are you tracking according to the, their apparent, uh, according to the, what would be the angular motion, depending on their distance from us? Or are you, so that's how you do it. So, so, so the way we end up doing it is we will just stare. Um, so this is a poster that my student made. So what you'll do is you'll just kind of map out some region. In this case, it's about two by two degree region. And you'll just tile together a lot of images. Our imager is only about a third of a degree or a quarter of a degree across. And so you'll sit there and you'll stare and take you know, a series of data. And in the post-processing, you'll pick I think right now we're using 100 different vectors, so different directions and different velocities within kind of a, a reasonable range for near Earth asteroids. And so certainly you can tune those, that search parameter space where you search for kind of more distant objects like Kuiper Belt objects or satellites actually, which is kind of one of the more nefarious uses for this application. But, um, but certainly you can, you can dial that knob however you want. So you're not tracking all the stars. Um, we are, so what you end up doing is, let's imagine this is my field. <clears throat> I will take, let's say, um, 500 images in this field. And then what I'll do is, assuming my telescope hasn't drifted very much, if there's a little drift, what I'll first do is I'll align to the stars. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and do a source detection, um, try and remove all of these individual stars that you can see in the individual images, and then start shifting each of these 500 frames and combining them. Because I've removed all my stars, um, if I hadn't removed my stars, then they would get blurred out and they'd be streaks because I'm shifting every image and then combining them. Since I've removed the stars, when I shift and combine, I should really see nothing. Um, but if, a, if, a, if there is a moving source that's moving in the right direction, then you'll start to see that as a signal. So have you found anything yet, or is this still uh, in the Are still blind? So, uh, yeah, that's a question. Um, we have found things, but most of the things we've looked for, so in our blind mode, this is a candidate. Um, I don't know what the final verdict was on that particular candidate, but we've certainly been able to find known asteroids um, with this technique. And so we know the technique works. We're mostly it's kind of tuning the, the software and actually improving mechanical limitations with the telescope and the imaging system. So actually, I'll, I'll, I'll admit that we spent the better part of this, you know, last nine months um, upgrading some of their cameras, fine-tuning the mechanical tracking of our telescope um, to precisions that we never had to bother with before in order to make this system work. Mm -hmm. so, and, what, this and what magnitude do you think you'll, you can reach? We should be able to get down to like 20th magnitude. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Okay. Are so, any of your students uh, doing any of the software work? Um, I've had, for this project, mm -hmm. um, I've had a couple of students go to JPL and Mostly the processing software is built. And so a lot of the software they're doing is you know, Python code to kind of optimize the observing procedure or build pipelines to do basic reduction. But they're not building kind of the, this, the, the search engine. That was already there. But I think they could, actually, because it's a MATLAB code. It's not super efficient. I think anyone could do this in principle. The mm -hmm. thing that it takes is a pretty fast computer to run this stuff, right? So a night of data actually takes a couple of nights to process right now. Do you have a fast computer or do you use mm -hmm. JPL stuff? JPL has their fast computer. So the, the biggest bottleneck is bringing the data down. So we can run this pipeline on the telescope. Uh -huh. it's, a, it's not quite as efficient. If we bring it all down, we can run it on the fast machines JPL, but the time it takes to transfer it is actually part of the bottom line. And I think I saw you've got a 2-1 line coming down then. Yeah. Right. I think that's been upgraded recently, but I don't know that it's mm -hmm. um, Any, any other questions? questions? I sure like that, that graphic where you, uh, the schematic where you showed the uh, waveforms coming in, 
uh, and then see the see the deformable mirror actually wiggling. Uh, that was a that was a really good uh, graphic. There. This, this, this that thing, one, yeah. yeah. This really just kind of nails it down. You see this? Mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. I showed this to a colleague of mine, and he was so impressed with what I was doing until he saw this video. And he's like, "Oh my God, it's actually so easy!" <laughs> 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 he's like, what are we doing for? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I never do that. Yeah. And it's, it's true. true. So I, I'm, I'm refraining from showing this too often. Did you uh, did you craft that? No, I wish. No, this is from the Gemini Observatory. They crafted this years ago. You can kind of tell it's like ni late 90s image quality. So, uh, if it's as to the mirror that you're deforming with the piezoelectric um, devices, what, what is the composition? What, what is it made out of? That's a good question. Um, I actually don't know. The, I know the coatings, but I don't actually know what the, what the thickness of the of the mirror itself is. But I will tell you, it's just, an, the, the, other, okay, the, the other thing about this instrument um, that made it unique is that the vast majority of AI instruments are custom built million dollar instruments because you're building these for two and 10 meter telescopes. This is mostly off, not mostly, this is largely off the shelf. And so that wow. deformable mirror is a Thor Labs mirror you could, at the time, five or six years ago, we bought that for, I don't know, maybe in a kit like, 12K. Nowadays, you can buy the mirror by itself for you know uh, thousands of dollars, right? Um, and so you could just go. And, uh, Thor Labs would have the specs for that, but I I don't, I don't know them. Mm -hmm. um, the only things that are really custom in our system are some of the optics had to be custom designed because we had to, we had to um, do the optical design. The cameras are expensive, but they are also all off the shelf. We didn't have to do all of that hard work, which is what makes it possible. You know, most AO. Um, projects or kind of custom building everything to kind of really maximize um, um, performance, and we were able to get away with things because we're small aperture. We could get away with just you know cherry picking. Do you correct using the standard Zernike polynomial series, or do you use some other series for uh, doing your wavefront? Yeah, so so we actually use so this is again this is the. Um, the wavefront reconstructor. So again, the thing we're measuring is just these slopes, um, and we're not actually modeling the oh. the, um, the wavefront by decomposing into Zernike's, which you might do, and we visualize it this way. But we're actually just kind of doing more of an empirical um, wavefront construction. Okay, so you just hand them like a servo. Then. Yeah, that's right. I see. Oh, I always wondered if that would work. Yeah, yeah, it works for us. <laughs> hmm. Any Anything else? Questions? Very good. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, let's thank Dr. Choi. Once again. Thank you.